So, uh, warm welcome to our focus talk. Today we're going to talk about the metaverse. So, what is the metaverse? What opportunities exist within the metaverse? Is the metaverse too good to be true? And how can we navigate it sustainably and responsibly? And the speakers for today are myself, Olivia, we have Sarah, and we have Therese. But before we introduce ourselves, we actually want you to get to know each other a little bit better. So we will start with a quick exercise where you will say hello to the people next to you or the persons next to you and find out the following. What's their name? What's the purpose of joining Women in Tech today? And what's their superpower? And finally, we really, really encourage you to add the person on LinkedIn. So time to mingle <laughs> a little bit. So, uh, may I have your attention once again? Seems like you are getting to know each other quite much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we are going to continue. It seems like uh, you are getting to know each other quite much. Excellent. I love all of this uh, conversation going, but uh, to introduce ourselves a little bit as well. And if I may start then, my name is Olivia and I work as a technology strategist at Accenture. And what that means is that I get the possibility to help companies shape their strategy and their vision and really leverage business value from the use of uh, technology. And I have the past years been very, very focused on the retail industry and primarily looking into how the future of store will look like and how both tech and security can enable that transformation. So handing over to you, Sarah. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Sara Rahimaniad and I also work as a technology strategist. I have also been focusing a lot on retail, uh, helping organizations to uh, design and implement their data and analytics strategy and also helping them designing new types of business models. But I'm also a impact accelerator coach for sustainable tech startups within fashion. And my name is Therese uh, Nilsson. I work in the same department as a tech strategist with Olivia and Sarah. And I am especially passionate about the role that technology can play in enabling sustainability, but also about taking a holistic um, and sustainable mindset in the way that we design and apply technology. Because if we're not mindful in the way that we apply resources, we might risk not getting the full benefits out of them. And we'll be touching a little bit on this later uh, during our session today. Uh, but before we move into our topic, we would just like to get you into the right mindset um, by turning to the person next to you and asking yourself, what does the metaverse mean to you? How would you define it? So take a few, few seconds and then we will ask for two to three responses. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Can I ask for your attention, please? 
Would somebody like to share their definition? Any, anyone uh, willing to share their definition of the metaverse with us? Any takers? I know you're not shy because you've been talking quite intensely with each other, so you have some, something to say about the topic. Or is it too abstract? I think I heard something here about the abstract. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? Perfect, then you need to learn them. <laughs> well, based on what I hear, um, it sounds as though... Um, it sounds as though the most of you have an opinion on it. And there are a lot of different opinions and ways of defining um, emerging technologies. And your opinion might be very different to my opinion, but that doesn't mean that your opinion or my opinion is wrong or right. And with novelty also comes a great deal of excitement. So we're seeing this huge hype around the metaverse. Everybody wants to get in on it and be a part of it. But with unclear definitions and at the same time a lot of hype, there's also a lot of confusion about what um, a concept such as the, the metaverse will mean to us uh, going forward in our everyday lives and mean practically. Is the metaverse the science fiction future where we will be consistently sharing this virtual space with one another? Are all of our social interactions going to be entirely virtual? And our answer to this question is not necessarily. So we define the metaverse as this bridge between the virtual and the physical world, between the vir virtual entities, um, identities and properties and physical identities, properties, and entities. And we can, talk, we can try to exemplify this a little bit by talking about the different technologies that underpin the metaverse. And I say technologies because it's not just one technology that the metaverse is about. So if we look here towards, towards the left, towards more of the physical world, we have augmented reality. So we have the real world, so the person here on the phone, <coughs> that you can see through it on the picture, that's being overlaid by a 3D digital object, so the, dig the virtual clothes. And by using this technology, we can see what something might look like um, in the real world without actually putting it on. And if we move more towards um, the virtual world here, we have virtual reality, or VR, as an example. And this really allows us to immerse all of our senses in this one digital space. So you can put on a headset and you can really feel that you're in a game, for example, or you're in a store and you can really experience it. And the truth is that right now there are a lot of different metaverses being built at the same time with many different ideas um, and initial focuses of how to get it right. Um, they can be for consumers, for enterprises. They use different platforms, different technologies, different partners. And that's why we refer to the metaverse as this continuum, a continuum of the spectrum of digitally enhanced worlds, realities, and business models. They're all really starting to emerge with many different types of technologies. And eventually this spectrum of ideas is going to merge into a more unified, broadly unified experience. But the business areas that it will touch is only going to just become bigger and bigger. And I think comparing the ideas of the metaverse um, and how it will develop <coughs> with the internet is really interesting, even though I was probably a bit too young to reflect on the internet when I was a kid and how that would develop <laughs> to look like. <laughs> but the internet went from just, it's not just, it went from being just about websites to really underpin the majority of businesses today. And the same thing with the metaverse, it's hard, we can't really expect that it's going to be limited to this one digital space. And now we would like to turn back to you guys and we're interested, where on this journey are you? Are you already engaging in the metaverse? Um, so we're going to have a few statements and ask you to raise your hand if they apply to you. So raise your hand if you have a personal 
avatar anywhere or use the personal avatar. What do you use it for? Josephine. <laughs> she uses my avatar. <laughs> Cool. Anyone else? Who raised their hand? <laughs> can any? Can you raise your hand? Who has an avatar? <laughs> For the same? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next statement. Raise your hand if you own any type of cryptocurrency. Wow. Wow. Impressive. I have to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then the last one, raise your hand if you own a virtual reality set. Mm. <laughs> so it seems mm -hmm. like we have a little bit of mixture in the crowd today. Lovely to see. So if we move forward then and uh, deep dive into why the metaverse has become such a hype and why everyone is talking about the metaverse, we are actually seeing that many players are already active and more and more are joining in. And there are, of course, many different explanations to why this is happening. And I actually read some cool uh, news flash some weeks ago that was stating that the metaverse market was supposed to be worth 8 trillion US dollar only in China. So what we're seeing is that many p companies and people are pumping money, time and efforts into the metaverse. And as you can see on the screen here, if I move a little bit, <laughs> 10,000 people, or the Meta, Meta, formerly known as Facebook, have set a recruitment target that they are going to hire 10,000 people only to work with developing the Metaverse. That's quite many. We have also had a strong technology acceleration, which of course has led to an increase or a higher degree of technology maturity. And what we're seeing is that that had created new opportunities for uh, increased evolution of new technologies. And another cool thing that I found, and I'm not sure if anyone of you attended, but in August last year, Travis Scott hosted a concert in Fortnite, the gaming platform, and over 27 million people attended. That's cool. And lastly, we are seeing that the different brands are using different platforms to reach different audiences. So for example, Supreme uses Fortnite, while Yves Saint Laurent uses Decentraland. But if we look on the other side and deep dive into the people side, I, I need to say, we are asking, or there's been a study where we have asked people, what do they want when it comes to the metaverse? And the most frequent answer is that they want to get together with friends or family. Some say that they want to watch a TV or a film, while 38% say that they want to host an event and perhaps become like Travis Scott. <laughs> a few want to see the concert, or in August, 27 million wanted to see the concert. Anyhow, either of these can really boost opportunities to create a 360 degree value creation in terms of, for example, experience where you can get this interactive, personalized content. From a sustainability angle, you can get less returns and less waste. And from a financial pers perspective, we will get new revenue streams. So zooming in a little bit then on looking at what kinds of opportunities exist for utilizing the metaverse. We have listed a couple of them here and uh, I will walk you through some of my favorites. So to start off with, we have the virtual products and that is when companies are utilizing digital products to enabling new platforms where the physical products can be experienced before even buying them. And I know for sure, Sarah, that you will talk more about this later on. So I think I will stop there. <laughs> and then we have uh, product design reviews. And that is when companies are utilizing 3D models in order to do product design reviews. And that means that we are able to overcome travel bans, we can cut cost, and we can speed up production and also minimize the sustainability impact. We also have learning and development 
and that is when uh, we have seen now that companies are using virtual reality and augmented reality to quicker train and upskill people. And looking from a research perspective, an active learning will trump a passive learning at all scale. And Metaverse really gives us this opportunity to bring an active, truly immersive learning to life at a scale that we have never seen before, which at least I found incredible. <laughs> and then we also have virtual spaces. And for the fashion industry, that perhaps might be virtual stores. We have virtual models and influences, digital manufacturing and supply chain, where you Imagine if you can have a digital twin of your manufacturing site and optimize the, uh, the stock inventory. That might be possible in the future. So with that said, maybe we should jump into the fashion industry, Sarah. Yes, as promised. <laughs> so um, Olivia mentioned these huge communities that are growing. And as they are growing, so is the interest for digital fashion and for consumption in general. And many fashion brands are already starting to explore this space. So one example is Gucci, who have created their world Gucci Garden on the gaming platform Roblox. And there, the famous Gucci bag, the virtual famous Gucci bag, was sold for over $4,000. And that is actually a much higher price tag than what you would buy a physical Gucci bag uh, for in a physical store. We, are the, we also see different types of artists creating uh, fashion NFT items to sell in the metaverse. And we are also seeing a lot of purely digital fashion brands now only launching digital fashion collections. Uh, but brands are not only uh, exchanging their portfolio from physical to digital items. They are really starting to explore the whole end-to-end -end design journey. And this is possible today due to the maturity of tech that are cornerstones in the metaverse, such as 3D visualization and digital twin tech, as, as Olivia mentioned. And Accenture has actually built a engine where you can utilize synthetic modeling and so utilizing different types of data sets, both open and uh, internal, to kind of uh, simulate uh, clothing and garments in different types of environments on different types of avatars, because then you can design for a broader range of customers. So let's take a look of what this could look like. Yes, I think I will stop there. So that was one example of how fashion brands really can take their whole design uh, process into the digital space. Here we have another really cool example. H&M Foundation has explored fashion in the metaverse with a totally different angle. They have last year launched a purely digital fashion collection worn by a purely digital avatar. And the name of this fashion collection, the Billion Dollar Collection, is a reference to all of the billions of dollars needed in annual investments in the fashion industry in order to turn it around to be sustainable until 2030. 
So to show what opportunities that actually already exist today, this fashion collection represents 10 sustainable tech startups that actually has a huge potential to create a great impact in, in the fashion industry. Um, and our colleagues uh, at Macavision, a part of Accenture, have created all of the virtual content in this fashion collection. And we, of course, wanted to put our best team on this project. So the Hollywood team has made this collection. Uh, and to show you what technology that actually lies behind this type of creation, I thought I would show you the making of video that we have made about it. Cool, huh? <laughs> <laughs> At least I think so. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> and I think, uh, I mean, Sarah really brought so many great examples of how people and organizations are uh, finding ways to apply the metaverse today. And it's not only about creating these fun and new and cool experiences. It's really about improving the ways that we work and, and, and live and, and interact with one another. But I would like to connect back to something that I mentioned in the beginning of our session. So about the importance of taking a holistic mindset and approach to when we design and apply technology and reflect about possibly unintended consequences. And I think this is especially relevant uh, for new and emerging technology concepts such as the metaverse, where we see this huge hype and we kind of risk blinding ourselves um, and not thinking about uh, potential effects. And <clears throat> what's interesting about the metaverse is that there are a lot of paradoxes. So a lot of things that we see as benefits can actually, it, from a different light, um, turn out to be potentially negative effects. And the first example that we have um, about this is the risk is the potential that we see in reducing our mass consumption and production um, of physical clothes. So while we move parts of our consumption to this digital space and, and find a way to express us, ourselves there, and digitizing parts of the design and production uh, design phase, and that way reducing um, the physical amount of resources that we need. We also see that the technologies that enable the metaverse actually use a lot of energy and we risk fueling greenhouse gas emissions or get landing in this net zero situation. And we also see that while we have these amazing possibilities to express ourselves and enabling diversity and inclusion through um, different body types and that Sarah showed us <clears throat> with the video, we also need to think about the fact that a lot of these consumers that are in these digital spaces are also young uh, people, uh, kids using their entire pocket money to spend on virtual goods. And while we have these unlimited possibilities to create these social worlds to interact in, we're seeing 
risks, we're seeing examples of unwanted behavior such as bullying, assault, or even criminal behavior in the metaverse. And some psychologists are also asking, what about loneliness? I mean, we're already seeing it now in social media. We're spending so much time online and we see risks of loneliness and, and mental illnesses increasing because of this. What will this increasing, immersing ourselves into digital spaces affect that? And I can go on and on about this, but <laughs> I think one last example is related to cryptocurrencies that have been praised as um, having potential to democratize economies. But we're seeing that only a small fraction are actually being able to capitalize on this and capitalizing on the hype around cryptocurrencies, while others have actually taken a quite bad hit from very fluctuating and unstable markets. And that's why we think it's really important that, we, that when we talk about metaverse, that we think about these issues. So all of these paradoxes that I mentioned now, they touch upon a few key questions that we think are relevant to, to reflect about when we start engaging in the metaverse. So talking about the risks of increasing environmental impact, what can we do to lower the metaverse's environmental impact and even better ensure that it's green? And how can we ensure that the metaverse, instead of in allowing sex for sexual harassment and bullying, really ensures these intended and truly human connections and interactions. And with the metaverse being at a very, very early stage and no real governance surrounding it, who owns the responsibility for ensuring that we have the right security and trust controls in place to make sure that, we're, that we don't see fraud? And I think also reflecting about the spread of fake news, especially with the possibilities of creating these real life avatars. How are we, how are we supposed to ensure that we, that doesn't happen? So I'm handing over to Sarah <laughs> to give us a few thoughts on this. Maybe not the full answer, but at <laughs> least <laughs> some reflections and some guiding principles. So of course, technology can also be a part of the solution, right? So the key question that we need to ask ourselves is really how to navigate the metaverse responsibly and sustainably. So when we start talking about the how, it is important to understand that we need to get responsibility right from the start. Because the metaverse pioneers will, of course, see great opportunities of being the first movers, right? So they are developing uh, this space uh, as fast as possible. But the metaverse is then being developed in a much faster pace than policies and regulations can be put in place, as TDS mentioned. And many are already expressing concerns around bias and fairness around what impact the metaverse actually will have on humans and on the environment. Because the choices the front runners make today will set the standards for everyone that follows. And therefore, it's quite important to have responsibility built in by design. So when we are building for the future, to really have these kind of frameworks, these mindsets and structures in place to ensure that it is built in from the start. Uh, and this is, of course, difficult to navigate, right? Easier said than done. So we thought that we would highlight three key guiding principles to help us uh, navigate this space. So it is important to be authentic in the use of technology, meaning that we should have a genuine purpose when we are building for the future really using technology for good, rather than just building something for the hype or actually not having thought about your purpose from the start. Um, so examples of technologies for good can be building in synthetic data as counter bias when training AI algorithms or setting up a AI governance structure and responsible AI framework before actually going deep into training AI algorithms. It can also be very useful to have an ecosystem mindset uh, because that kind of sets common standards among peers and that builds trust and authenticity. So one example uh, of tech that actually has built a common standard and then 
build trust among your peers is the application Bank ID. Uh, that is widely used within the Swedish society, and with this being adopted uh, in a great extent, this also really sets the standard of how we would like to share or protect our identity on digital platforms. So other examples of this could be blockchain tech to protect uh, the authenticity of designers in the metaverse, or it could actually be open source codes and engines, engines to really set a standard uh, when we move into uh, new tech or new applications. And last but not least, um, it's of course uh, important to have sustainability built in by design. So really thinking about sustainability in technology and thinking about sustainability through technology. So sustainability in technology could, um, could for example, be having this holistic view of the tech industry and really understanding how to reduce carbon uh, emissions in every kind of step of the value chain or work to to increase recyclability in IT hardware. And sustainability through technology for me is really stopping and thinking about are we focusing on the right type of problems and the right types of solutions. So as Olivia mentioned, we are pumping in so much money and efforts in building the metaverse. There are so many smart and cool tech people that are just building and building. But what if we focus those e efforts to actually do something for good, to actually build something in the metaverse that perhaps can have a planet positive impact? So keeping the focus. And of course, I can also uh, go on forever, but I think with these three guiding principles at least, uh, you are ready to now hear about how to get started. Yes. So uh, if we move forward, stake your claim in the metaverse continuum, we say. One of the key takeaways from organizational leaders is that even if this trend is in quite early stages, in some industries more than other, and it can be quite difficult to grasp, it is time to start engaging with the topic start to see what kinds of capabilities do we need to build around it. And when we launched uh, Accenture's Tech Vision, there were uh, many running. And if I remember correctly, 10% of the respondents stated that the metaverse wasn't relevant for them. And you can compare this to the early days of the internet, when people were asking themselves, why do I need a digital present? The internet is just supposed to be a fade, or the internet will be a digital copy of our physical brochure. Now we're actually seeing the same kinds of question once again, and people are asking themselves, is remote work here to stay? Do I need to care about the metaverse? And I mean, come on, the answer is quite simple. Yes, you need to care about the metaverse. So in order to get started then, we usually get questioned how to get started. And when we hold this presentation, we said, you need to think big, you need to start small, and you need to scale fast. And what I mean with that is you need to start learning about the metaverse. What is it? Why should we enter it? Should we enter it just because everyone else is entering? Or do we actually see a value? Then you need to start quite small. So start by setting your strategy, do some use case ideation and then scale fast. So you scale your numbers of operation, you expand the numbers of use cases, and you explore what other opportunities there exist within the metaverse. So with that said, we want to end with a quote from Amanda Poem, uh, Gorman, <laughs> and she said, let us not return to what was normal, but reach toward what is next. And we really hope that the metaverse can guide us towards what is next. So with that said, we say thank you and we open for questions or thoughts. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions or comments or thoughts? We have one here. Hi. Yeah, um, with the responsibility, and um, that's like in the very early stage, 
I saw during this film um, was kind of like one type of body size. How is it like? Because it's you're you're like in a part where you can actually change the fashion industry and the the view of how people look like. So you use like different body shapes and stuff like that. Primary, not like one type of body size, and then you can choose a bigger or smaller size that you mix. How? What, what's the point of view of that? Like, um, so, sorry, I didn't really understand the question. Um, like bigger models or yeah. smaller models or different type of models. In the H and M was only one type of model, um, and yeah. that that that's like primarily in the in the fashion industry. It's like one size, kind of thin people. I understand. Uh, that's not bad, but it's like different models. So, you know. But I think that uh, was kind of H and M foundation design, so I can't really comment on that. Um, but very interesting question. But then we saw the other application <coughs> where we have different types of uh, body types that you can choose from. Um, so, I mean, those are the possibilities that we see uh, are enabled when we can work with avatars in this way. So, um, I think ASOS actually works also with uh, different, on, on their website with different avatars. Or I've seen prototypes, something. Yeah. But of course, I think it's very relevant. I think it's also a shift of mindset, right? Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, uh, we still have a long way to go, right, in the industry of how we think about what consumers we are aiming for and, and so on. Good question. <laughs> and I'm poor? Yeah. Oh, yes, uh, yes. Now we're only talking about uh, digital products. Uh, yes. uh, what's your take on f to be able to buy physical products in Metaverse? Good question. I mean, we uh, explained the, uh, the Gucci bag. Uh, that is actually a physical product, but they have one in the metaverse as well that looks exactly the same. And I think the cool thing with the Gucci bag is that, as Sarah mentioned, the Gucci bag in the metaverse, I think it cost 4,000 US dollar compared to the real bag. I mean, it looks exactly the same. I think it cost 20,000. 20,000. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. We have seen, like, there are, of course, it's very difficult to to just uh, get one answer, right? But in different types of um, I researches that are, if you sell something in the metaverse with your brand, it can also kind of spike uh, the, uh, the goods sold in your physical stores. So there is a connection, um, but I think it's quite early to understand, like, what the implications actually are for the future. I also think it's quite cool with this, uh, now we didn't touch it, but the vir virtual stores that are building up. And I know that Fendi, for example, has a virtual flagship store in New York where you actually can walk into the physical store on the online or in on the metaverse and explore it. And that's the physical that they have copied in the metaverse. And it looks exactly the same. And that's quite cool. And I think we will see more of that going forward. But I see that, or do you want to add something? <laughs> no, just final comment. Also, I mean, the video that we saw here with the, the design process of clothes that you can digitize, but they're actually also physical clothes. But the actual design process, instead of trying on different types of uh, material, you can see the different flows with, with these technologies. So that's also one potential connection and how we see this bridge between the physical and, and the virtual. But I... Last, I, last question. <laughs> I had one question. Um, so uh, you compared to internet at the beginning of the talk, and <coughs> now we're at the beginning of the metaverse, and we're seeing the big enterprises entering the space. I was uh, wondering what your thoughts are on um, having a shared metaverse between the different enterprises and smaller companies um, like gaining that true metaverse where everybody can meet and collaborate <coughs> yeah I mean as we mentioned in the beginning there are a lot of different metaverses being created right now and some of these might be combined I think also related to this ecosystem thinking creating uh, common standards and ways of working so um, that they're they can work across different uh, platforms. I mean, right now, like you're saying, they're, they're 
it's happening in many different places. But um, I think with this ecosystem mindset in, in mind, uh, we need to probably start moving at least towards some type of common standards so that we can work across different metaverses. So definitely. And I would say like you, you see different types of like um, organizations or like individuals actually building their different worlds in both centralized and decentralized platforms. So I, I think it's a spectrum and you can kind of uh, approach and enter the metaverse in your different way, right? But uh, as these communities and as these platforms are growing, we kind of see that it will merge in the future into something something that we quite, we can understand it, but not really know exactly what it will be in the future. I think we have to wrap up for the next session. Yes. yes. <laughs> but if you have any more questions, thoughts, just talk to us. Talk to us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>